a few things here that I want to say in introduction. Um, most of you can read more details about Dr. Karsten from the uh, promotional uh, flyer that was associated with this workshop. But she is the uh, Ann Associate Professor of Psychology at uh, Western New England University. And I need to read this. She, um, her research emphasizes the design and effective acquisition pro the design of effective acquisition programming and translating behavior analytic technologies from research to practice. That's a mouthful. Um, and Dr. Karsten is also uh, an editorial board member and associate um, or guest associate editor for the analysis of verbal behavior and for um, Java or Jabba, however you like to say that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and lastly, um, among other things, Dr. Karsten collaborates with Dr. Bonnie Alpert. Am I saying that right? Dr. Bonnie Alpert, the Dean of Student Disability Services to deliver peer-mediated social and academic support programs for college students diagnosed with ADHD or ASD. Um, so t this is a little bit disjointed, but I've been asked to make one more <laughs> quick announcement. So sorry to steal your thunder here. Um, if you're online and you have a question, uh, there should be a box at the bottom that says questions, aptly titled, uh, ask a question to the speaker. Those actually come right here, so if you can see that online. So if you have a question for Dr. Carson, type it in there uh, and they'll come up to her, uh, to her here. So um, I, I won't take any more of your time, um, Dr. Amanda Carson. Western Michigan University and the principles of learning who supervised my teaching in classrooms and living rooms and hospital <laughs> units for over a decade now. So my science and my mentors have taught me a lot. I worked too with uh, Tiny Tots learning to play or learning to use the potty, working on that with my own son now. Um, I've also worked with school age children learning functional communication and college students learning to make and mend friendships. My clients have taught me a lot. And yet, um, I'm not the teacher I need to be. It can't help me. This richness of experiences and the, my emotional investment in the clients I work with today can't help me to decide my next best step as a teacher. Can't help me from starting this sort of worry playlist. So let me tell you a little bit about what that sounds like. Um, what if my new supervisee, Michael, what if I ask him to use a teaching procedure and it just doesn't work? Okay, what if Emma, who is dying to go to summer camp, doesn't make it again this year because the toilet training procedures that I recommend for her parents are just not realistic to maintain? What if my own son Noah ends up being the token biter in his classroom, his toddler classroom, or wakes up every three hours every night until he's seven? Okay, these are real concerns in my world. So again, my science and my clients have just not been enough for me to turn down the volume on that worry playlist and identify, reveal my next best and most effective step as a teacher. And just for the record, some folks I've observed probably ought to turn the worry playlist up, just a, just a touch. Okay? But we all as teachers need a concrete way to cut through the noise and to um, hone in on the individuals that we're working with. And we can do that through the laser sharp focus of behavioral data. What I hope to share today are some simple strategies for you to harness the richness of your experiences and your understanding of the science and put them to play for more lasting and individualized decisions in your everyday practice. Okay? And so we all as teachers, in order to become the teachers our clients and supervisees and even our own kids really need us to be, um, need to include them in our decisions. And that is to say we need to include their unique and revealing behavior. So a little bit of housekeeping and a first key concept. Um, good data, we'll define that, tell the story of the people you serve. Notice this doesn't say that good data tell a story, okay? It's the story. It's the reality of what their behavior looks like, not your perception of it, not your assumptions about it. 
Um, the people I'm referring to here are not just the clients, the students with disabilities in many cases that you're responsible um, for supporting their learning. This can also include the change agents, the teachers, the parents, the caregivers who you depend on to actually deliver the programming that you design. Okay, so people includes everybody you serve and I include in that parents and teachers that you might be training to deliver actual assessment and teaching procedures. So good data tell the story of the people you serve and it's a story that hints at their history and reveals much about their current environment. Okay, we need that information again to bring our science and what we know the about the principles of learning to bear in a specific and individual case. Behavioral data is the way to do this. So using data to make decisions, in each section today we're going to have sort of three foci. Um, the first is to define our goals and the role of data in achieving those goals. The second is to demonstrate and describe some everyday tactics for using more data in your decisions. And the final step is to plan for the dissemination of our data-driven ways, because we can't do this alone. Okay? I can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. You operate within cultures and organizations where there are lots of different value systems, lots of different um, pedagogy in terms of how teaching should occur, um, the best way to support the, those that we serve. And so we need to think and have in mind how we contribute not just to our own improved and data-driven decisions, but the culture in which we're um, operating. So we'll hit on each of these in each of the sections uh, we cover uh, in the first half of today. I want to elaborate on everyday. If you look up everyday in a thesaurus, the synonyms are things like mundane, familiar, routine. And I chose to use the term everyday in part of my title on purpose because I don't think these are things that we do every day, but I think they're things that we should do every day. Okay, and this is based on my experiences consulting in various organizations. Um, and before I even became a behavior analyst and was formally trained, just um, observing and volunteering as a high schooler even in schools and seeing the way that um, the decision-making process and how students were treated wasn't really systematic. Everybody had a different answer instead of people being able to agree on the methods and values that are going to get our students the farthest. So every day, in the sense of mundane and routine, that's the goal we're, we're headed for, that this stuff is not so novel, that it's something you can see all around you. And I'm not sure we're there yet. Okay, so identifying treatments that work, that's our first um, topic we want to tackle today. Uh, you guys face a lot of treatment and assessment decisions when you're working with an individual client, and it's sometimes hard to know and to have the time to figure out which is most likely to be effective. So we want to delve into that treatment selection process here. So you have many opportunities to make decisions and to use data. And I, I should qualify here as we get into our first um, set of examples, so selecting or developing solutions, that I mean decision in a pretty broad sense, and I mean it in a behavioral sense. To me, a decision is um, something that you do anytime you plan to change the way you're interacting with a client or the way that you're recommending others interact with a client. Okay, so I'm using decisions pretty broadly. They can be with respect to your own behavior or with respect to the behavior of others, but they're planful. The things you've actually sorted through and decided between multiple options. So let's hone in on selecting treatments that work um, and a little bit on following through on those treatments in this first section. So evidence-based practice is a term that you may have heard. It's just sort of starting to eke its way into the um, education and behavior analytic worlds. Um, but there's a long history in the field of medicine, of evidence-based uh, medicine and evidence-based practice. Uh, in the early days of medicine, you had folk healers, traditional healers, who were responsible for the care of people who were ailing in society. And then uh, medical doctors came along, and they were the regulars. They were formally trained to provide those services. But before we had the equalizing force of science, before we really documented what worked, people were operating largely on trial and error. So whether you went to a formally trained physician or to a full healer, you might have a similar probability of effective treatment. In fact, there were some practices among early physicians that were probably more dangerous and more deleterious to the health of their patients um, than the full healers. And we can even still see that within certain specialties in medicine. Um, today. So this is the model that we're operating on within the field of psychology, uh, education, and behavior analysis. The goal of evidence-based practices is to protect consumers, okay, first and foremost, by promoting the following outcomes. We want decision makers, practitioners, to base their decisions on the scientific literature. What works? Okay, that's our, that's our focus. We want people to be able to predict the costs and benefits of the options that are available to them. To incorporate client preferences and values, Okay, so you have to adapt what works to the specific people that you're going to be serving and what their goals are and what their resources are. 
And then finally, we're going to evaluate success on an individual level. So part of evidence-based practice, which is this umbrella term used not only in psychology and education, but in behavior analysis um, as well, uh, is, is to bring it back to whether what you thought would work worked in the individual case. Okay, uh, another term I'm going to use today is evidence uh, or empirically validated treatments, and they're closely related, so I just want to draw some points of contrast between the two. So I mentioned before, evidence-based practice involves individualization of treatment to client preferences and resources. Evidence-based or empirically validated treatments is the toolbox that you use. Okay, that's the scientifically supported best treatments that you start with. And then the process of individualizing them is part of that broader um, term, evidence-based practice. So when I refer to EVTs, I'm just talking about the technology, just talking about the treatments that you can do a lit search on, as we'll talk about momentarily, and um, see the degree to which people have researched and found it effective. Okay, um, how do we find out what these evidence-based treatments are? Um, well, we oftentimes have folks who try to save time for practitioners by forming expert panels and getting together and agreeing on standards of evidence or levels of evidence. So what are the treatments that we know are well supported? What are the treatments that we think are promising or have emerging support? And what are those treatments that we really still do not know enough about them to prescribe them in everyday practice? So these expert panels get together and they review all of the uh, empirically evaluated or empirically validated treatments and they organize them into practice standards or lit reviews. And that will be a big focus and a tool in your uh, approach to identifying treatments that work. Okay, so how can these practice standards help um, training programs and help individuals, practitioners out there in the field and educators in the field? Hopefully, they help us figure out what the most effective treatments are, right, in less time than it would take for you to read every relevant journal and every relevant article that's published um, in your specialty and to do so on a regular basis. Uh, these practice standards can also help us to secure funding for treatment. So, for example, if you work with insurance companies, they oftentimes want documentation that you are, in fact, using uh, practices known to benefit um, the population you're serving. Practice standards may be good for consumers, too, because it can help them to d distinguish between scientifically supported and unsupported um, services that might be offered through the various um, professionals that they interact with. Uh, so the idea is that these are a quick, accessible way to get updated on all of that research, all of that science that is going on all the time in the world of education. There are some good resources for consumers that I'm just going to mention briefly here. So if the goal is to get sort of an orientation to what some of our uh, empirically validated treatments are um, and to use language that's very accessible, uh, the Behavior Analysis Certification Board has a set of practice guidelines that was actually written with insurance providers in mind to help set the standard for who should be eligible uh, for reimbursement um, and what kinds of services they should be providing. And this is a great plain language document that um, I recommend for parents of children with disabilities, for people who are new to the field of special education or behavior analysis, for um, you know just about anybody that I want to give a nice general orientation. So even though we're going to spend most of our time on more technical resources, I hope you'll keep these in mind um, and think about sharing them with some of the people who are interested in learning more about the science and the standards of the work that you do. Okay. The New York State Department of Health report is old. It's from 1999. Um, this is the version relevant to autism. They subsequently published one related to Down syndrome and some other developmental disabilities. Um, even though it's old and outdated, the language and the format is so accessible, I still recommend it as a starting point uh, to some of the families that I work with. Now into the technical stuff. So where can we get information about treatments that work? Well, we can start with... Um, this pyramid which shows you all different sources and uh, outlets for research. Okay, this is a time-consuming process if you're going to tackle the whole pyramid. So let's not do that. Let's break it down to the place where you can get the most and the best information as quickly as possible because your lives are busy. Um, I have to tell you that uh, one survey of school psychologists found that they spend one hour per week actually reviewing and reading the published research literature. Um, that's probably not enough to stay on top of um, what's available out there, depending on the range of clients you serve. And I'm guessing that that's probably um, a pretty uh, generous estimate of how much time practicing professionals actually have to sit down and search and read the literature. So we're about to hone in on some um, strategies that hopefully will help you to get this done, but in a more economical and time-sensitive manner. So we have two sources that we can look for treatments that work. Uh, Peer-reviewed published research, this is the pyramid, it's huge. 
We also have practice-based evidence. Okay, so sometimes we're working with clients for whom we still don't have good answers about um, how our science can be adapted to their needs. They may have a target behavior that's especially intractable or tough to treat. They may have um, you know, a history of treatments that should have been effective, but they just weren't. Where do we go next? And we're not at a loss be just because there's not published research to guide us, okay? We have our concepts and principles, but in addition to that, you have your practice-based evidence, okay? So the data that you are collecting with those individual clients on a daily basis. And this is the formative approach to research-driven um, and data-driven services. There doesn't have to be a published article. You can be systematic in the evaluations you do in your work today. Okay, there are some limitations of the uh, reviews and practice standards I'm about to recommend as your first step, so I just want to acknowledge those briefly. Um, these standards vary widely in their inclusion criteria, their methodology, and also the composition of the expert panel that puts the information all together. Um, so you'll hear criticisms of these standards, not including things that they should, that the people were biased when they decided what subset of the literature to review. They're still a useful starting point but they're not gospel, okay? People have, uh, because it's filtered information, people will have different interpretations, and that's good and healthy for a data-driven um, practice. Um, varying degrees of comprehensiveness, so um, some are gonna give you a lot more information about education-oriented interventions versus very explicitly behavior analytic or, um, interventions, and I'll give examples of each of those. And they're very time and resource intensive to prepare. What do you suppose that means? like the 1999 report that I'm still recommending, these things are old, okay? They don't include the most recent cutting edge um, information, and so it's probably not enough to really keep you up to pace with the research in your practice. However, it's a great starting point, kind of like not one-stop shopping, but it's a really, it's like going to the department store first. You're most likely to find what you need, even though you may end up at those specialty markets after the fact. Okay, so let's get into strategies here. Identifying treatments that work. And um, very soon, I'm going to be launching into the first application question. If you've looked in your folder for today, you'll see that there's a Word document where you can actually type in responses to some of the questions I'll be projecting. And I'm going to give you a minute to really reflect on those questions, because as we're working through, I want you to consider your specific clients and your specific practice setting. Try to really put this information to use or envision how you might apply it in the future. So we'll get into the first strategy, and then pretty soon thereafter, talk about our first application. So strategy number one for identifying treatments that work is to form solution-oriented solution lit review teams. Okay, and I'm going to provide some basic steps here, but there's one additional resource. It's an article by Carr and Briggs in 2011 in Behavior Analysis and Practice, and they offer a lot more detail that's going to help you to get the job done. They give actual websites and subscription costs for some of the journals that um, would fit into the steps I'm recommending. They give some time-saving techniques I won't have time to mention today. So check out Karin Briggs in 2011 um, if this strategy seems like one that's especially relevant to you bringing your practice to the next level. Okay, so the goal of your review with these research teams should be to start with a problem that's relevant to specific client, classroom, team, or site. Okay, don't go out there and try to tackle the whole literature one article at a time without a goal in mind. This process is difficult and time consuming and you need to have some reinforcers associated with the outcome. Okay, the solution should be reinforcing to contributors, the people responsible for actually seeking out and synthesizing the literature. The solution ideally will address some non-preferred procedure or maybe a target for a student or teacher that's just really tough to make progress on. Okay, so make this process pay off for you as the supervisor or the direct teacher. You should also in your team agree on a useful final project and product and timeline. Small bites is the goal. Okay, we want something we can chip away at a little bit weekly um, on a weekly basis and end up with a product that's useful and leads to reinforcers or easier uh, everyday work for, for a few people and then when that's successful we can move on and tackle some bigger problems. But you want a real specific final product, for example a presentation or training event on the topic that you review, a new or revised data form, Okay, maybe one of the topics you decide to look into is the best ways to measure the kinds of targets that are really tough to measure for your students or in your organization. Um, you might also come up with a new or revised protocol. So I'll be providing some examples a little bit later on um, the challenges of teaching self-care chains using forward and backward chaining. Um, these tasks are complicated, okay? They've got 10 or more steps. They're messy. 
They involve water and materials that if they get thrown in the toilet or dropped on the floor, you just can't keep going like a toothbrush. Um, and so they're really tough to teach and teachers um, that I've worked with uh, don't look forward to teaching them. They also tend to be scheduled at the busiest times of day, so at transitions. You're trying to get to the bus to get to school if you work in a residential program or to get to the um, vocational site and that's when you've got to do toileting and toothbrushing and all the things that are super hard to get done. So it's just a perfect storm. And you might want to think about self-care chains as one of the areas um, where you'd like to go in and do a data-driven overhaul. Okay. So your goal needs to be reinforcing, and that brings us to our first application question. So as I said before, what procedures um, are relevant in your organization do you encounter on a daily basis that may benefit from this kind of a data-driven overhaul? You need it to be easier. You need it to be more effective. You need people to be more on board with actually doing it. I want you here to think about, again, real specific clients, somebody you've worked with um, for an extended period of time, somebody you worked with most recently, and think about their toughest program area, the one that you do not look forward to, um, or that you do not um, believe will be successful when you hand it over to the teachers or parents who are also in charge of teaching. Think about that for a minute and come up with one example of an assessment or a treatment procedure that you would just love to overhaul. I'm going to give you a minute to think about it. You might want to just jot down um, in handwritten notes or on your actual handout that's in your folder for today um, what that procedure is because we're coming back to it later. Okay, so one procedure or target behavior. I see people conferring in the room here. I hope some of you joining us online can confer with people close to you as well. We're going to go ahead and move on with additional steps, but again, I hope you're able to picture at least one thing that is tough to do in your organization or with your clients that we might be able to improve through the research that's available. Okay, so who's going to help with this um, focused, solution-oriented lit review team? You should avoid the Lone Ranger scenario, okay? Don't go trying to change your little world, your little culture or organization all on your own because you'll burn out. You already, I'm guessing, have more work to do than fits in a single day. So this needs to be something that's really treated as an essential part of the job. Um, that means it's focused and that means it's scheduled um, and the, the labor is also shared. So we need to include multiple reviewers on a team and they should have those solution-related reinforcers and also availability. Just like any other priority, this should have a weekly time slot where the activity happens. Um, and it may require uh, taking something off of the plates of the reviewers while they're involved. So perhaps they um, aren't responsible for, if you uh, need to update graphs manually, maybe they're not responsible for a couple of target behaviors for a week so that they can squeeze 20 minute lit review session um, in at least once a week and chip away at it. But if you can get at least one hour per week, that's going to be of scheduled time when there's nothing else required of the people who are involved. That's going to be your best road to success and getting, again, solutions you can actually put into practice. Okay, and then each solution-oriented review team should include a facilitator if possible, kind of a lead, maybe the person who identified the problem or the area that could be improved. And ideally, this person would have some research experience. Maybe they completed a master's thesis or a doctoral dissertation. Um, maybe you do ongoing research in your organization, and, and this lead facilitator is going to be uh, actively engaged with that ongoing research. Uh, or maybe they just had some editorial experience. That would be perfectly acceptable. But you want a person who you can kind of uh, go to uh, for reliability on your decisions about which articles or which um, comprehensive lit reviews are providing information you can really trust about the treatments that work. Okay, so where should you go first? I've alluded to it, but start at the most comprehensive place, the tip of the pyramid. Okay, this is um, where the least amount of information we have is at this point, but it's packaged in a way that you can get a ton of information, um, least amount in terms of the number of reviews and standards available compared to the total number of articles. Uh, but you can access in one place a lot of information about specific procedures. So some examples of these practice standards and lit reviews. The National Standards Project from the National Autism Center was published in 2009 and is available for free online. It's very comprehensive, includes descriptions of each of the procedural components. People have criticisms. I'm aware of them. It's a great starting point. Um, the State of Maine has a wonderful report on practice standards and treatment of autism. This is a smaller document, which might be helpful, and it has a table, if you're looking for more, you know, close to one-stop shopping, a table that summarizes um, the levels of evidence for a variety of uh, empirically validated treatments that might be relevant. 
The Association for Science and Autism Treatment has a wonderful online resource um, that you can search and hyperlink directly to references and content under each of the headings. And I'm actually going to use um, the ASAT website as an example when I talk about um, the sample review that I put together for you guys. And then finally, What Works Clearinghouse. This is a wonderful resource, also very comprehensive, that uh, goes more broad in terms of the treatments and interventions. It, it touches on things that are used in um, special education but haven't necessarily made their way into the behavior analytic um, research literature. And so I, I find What Works Clearinghouse to be an ex excellent waypoint as I'm starting this lit review process. Okay, so how should you divide the work on your lit review team? You should definitely um, make sure that you have at least a couple reviewers per topic or goal because you want reliability on the decisions you reach in terms of what papers and lit reviews are most important to look at and what you take away from them. You need to search the recent literature as well to find updates. Remember I mentioned those comprehensive um, resources are old and outdated and they don't have the most cutting edge information and uh, so it's going to be important to have reviewers who can actually contribute to looking at more recent single case research as well. And then you need to create the final product, which might be the report or the presentation or the proposal. Um, but in this final product, you're actually suggesting the exact procedures and modifications to your ongoing programming that should be assessed for feasibility. Okay, so it's not an automatic jump from, boy, there's evidence for this and it seems really relevant to our students. Let's do it and let's do it program wide. There's a step in between that is our second strategy that's going to come next. So the final outcome of this first step, the lit review group, is just to identify what's possible. Okay, then we're going to move into what's relevant and what's feasible with your particular constraints. Okay, so a sample review, just to show you how these comprehensive resources are a great jumping off point. If I started with, um, so let's say in my organization, one of our initiatives is we want to do more group instruction. Um, my background is very much in early intervention, especially home-based early intervention for children with autism. And the goal is for those kids to um, head off to school and to be able to participate in classrooms where a lot of instruction is delivered in groups, even though most of what we do in traditional early intervention is intensive one-on-one -on -one teaching. So to make that leap, we might want to try and incorporate more group instruction, structured group instruction um, experiences into the, exp you know, the lives of those young children with disabilities. So if I wanted to improve the group instruction in my organization, I might start with the National Standards Project and What Works Clearinghouse and search and find that actually no headings match when I just look for group instruction. Now if you dug a little bit, I'm willing to bet you might find some relevant content, but it wasn't a quick and easy find, so I moved on. The State of Maine report um, identifies that we at this point have insufficient evidence for the techniques of group instruction that have been explored with children with autism. Okay, but they do provide some references for follow-up. When I go to the ASAT website and do a quick, again, topic uh, keyword search, I find that group instruction can be effective when it's used with other validated teaching met uh, methods, such as choral responding and contingent reinforcement. Okay, um, so that's a good bit of information and also ASAP provides a lit review and two additional e empirical studies that are pretty dated, um, 1994 is the most recent one that ASAP lists, uh, and then one related heading, so social skills groups for high functioning autism, that is another form of group instruction that may or may not be relevant to the students that you're trying to um, serve with this update on your practices. So that's a lot of information and a lot of starting points, and I was able to do this in you know, 15 or 20 minutes just by searching each of the, the big um, practice standard and lit review websites. But what do I do next? This still isn't an answer. So my next step was actually to go to PsychInfo. Now that Carr and Briggs paper is going to give you some suggestions for what you can do if PsychInfo is not available to you. PsychInfo is uh, typically uh, used, you know, available through university subscriptions. So if you happen to live close to your alma mater, it may be the case that you can go and go to their library and actually use their PsychInfo there just by being a member of the Alumni Association. Um, some libraries even have community access. You can get a one-day pass to come in and use their search engines. And once you know what you're looking for, you've done that comprehensive initial step, that might be worth your time if you have access to a university close to you. If not, Carr and Briggs provide other um, suggestions. For example, just subscribing uh, to some of the flagship journals like Java is ridiculously inexpensive. For 33 bucks a year, I think now, you can get your issues of Java and that's going to cover um, a lot if you're working with folks with developmental disabilities. It's going to cover a lot of the latest and greatest. It's not the only journal, but just as one example of um, how that might be the way to go if you don't have access to PsychInfo. But what I did as a follow-up, I did it since 
1994 because that was the most recent reference that the ASAT website provided for me on group instruction. I used the keywords autism and group instruction. So I didn't make this very, I wanted to see how wide I could cast the net initially on more recent work. And I did find that. Um, so this is, uh, just to orient you real quick, this is the Psych Info website and you can see they have um, a place to put in your keywords at the top and then down here you can actually limit to peer-reviewed and full-text articles and I just limited to peer-reviewed because I only want things that are showing up in um, you know uh, journals that uh, have been vetted and gone through the the peer review process I don't want things that are newsletters or conference presentations or book chapters and if you do want that information don't set the limiting factor okay so that gave me 49 papers which is a lot you don't have time in your week to sit down and read 49 papers. So I filtered out, and I'll show you what that screen looks like for social and adolescence, because I'm more interested in group instruction for academic skills, and I'm working with kids who are younger, okay? So here you can see, just by adding a couple of um, search terms and selecting not, as opposed to another and, you can really narrow down your search and end up with 29 papers. So that's better. It's still too much for you to get through um, in a foreseeable timeline. So I limit to quantitative. That's another option Psych Info affords you that unfortunately Google Scholar will not. But if I say I just want those um, studies that provide actual hard measures of whatever they were trying to change, not um, qualitative measures, so program descriptions or other things like that. I want you know, more empirical or hard data type evidence. And that gets me down to, whoops, 22 papers, okay, still a lot, but with a quick search of abstracts, I was able to get it down to 10. And let me tell you how quick that is, because the, some of the abstracts would say things like, um, you know, we're actually working with um, adolescents with conduct issues, not my population. I put that one in the past pile. Um, we are working with kids who are primarily focused on self-protection and abduction avoidance and that is not relevant to the skills I want to teach so quickly we can get this down to 10 papers now that's a pile of papers that's suitable for a lit review team we can assign a couple people to a few of those papers spread the work out over a few weeks and end up with a proposal of strategies that might be worthwhile updates okay so because these comprehensive resources are quick but they still don't provide a ton of recent information our work is not done um, we need to know about the single case design literature and this is the bread and butter of efficacy research when you're interested in individual behavior change. Um, I'm not trying to uh, skim over the fact that group comparison research teaches us something but it's just that a lot of that group comparison research probably would have been included in the comprehensive resources uh, whereas the single case design research um, is coming out a little more frequently in general with respect to certain treatments and so that's where you're going to capture the latest and greatest, again, with hopefully replicable, replicable results for the individuals you're working with. Okay, that's where we learn about behavioral process. So that's why I'm recommending it as the next step here. And we just described how you get down to that list of single case design research that you're going to get into. Okay, so you've got your list, and we should assign two, um, now this seems like it might be out of order, I apologize. This is kind of a follow-up on the, what I just showed you. So I showed you how I got down to the list of 10. You want two reviewers um, per article. Uh, you want to circulate uh, terms for feedback. Make sure your search was sufficiently comprehensive, which I should have mentioned before. Um, and you know maybe just pick the, so I got 10. Maybe I would pick the five most recent as a starting point for us to figure out what things we're actually going to propose for feasibility. And then we have to decide who participates in that feasibility assessment. So it should be people with a knowledge of the clients and the circumstances you're trying to better through the lit search. So back to your solution-oriented um, goal with this whole process. Okay, so this is where we, um, if we don't have single case research, get back to that formative approach. So even in the absence of published data, you can figure out treatments that work for the clients you're working with by collecting good behavioral data. We're going to get much more into that in the second talk today, but I want to touch on it just briefly here. Okay, so you need to find an expert. Find somebody who's done this work clinically, even if they haven't published it, and have them consult with you on the types of treatments that work uh, in their practice uh, and find out if they might be relevant to the clients in your practice. Okay, so just to review where we are, because I know I jumped around a little there. Comprehensive, quick access resources first, the lit reviews and the practice standards. Single case design literature next. If you come up empty, find an expert. Find out what they're doing in their practice and if they have data to suggest it's working for their clients. Um, 
This person, if you decide you can't really take on the pressure of working with a treatment that may work, but that we don't know works yet, uh, may actually be somebody who can help you to refer those clients for the needs, um, may help you to provide training or consultation, and they may tell you other search terms. So, oh, actually, we do have research on that. It's just labeled this way. It's been described as a different teaching package. Okay, and then, of course, once you identify uh, solutions for feasibility assessment and you decide to put them into practice, you're going to collect good data to make sure it's worth it before you roll those changes out organization-wide. Okay, and that brings us to the feasibility step, strategy number two. So you're going to update your practices with the most feasible and effective strategies first. Why are small changes important? Well, time and resources of the people who have to make those changes are going to be spared until we know there's actually a benefit. We want to be real careful about asking busy people to do more work um, before you know it's really going to pay off and help them contact more, um, a more satisfying work experience and more behavior change for their students. Also, teachers need to contact those reinforcers early and often in order to stay committed and continue with whatever treatment that works you've added to or modified in their practices. Okay, um, so we need to make sure that not only our methods and our protocols, but our materials, uh, the systems we're going to use to train people in how to use the new treatment that works, uh, all of the other supports that they need are already in place before we roll this out um, to people for the first time. So there's a real um, research and development process that has to happen even after you've decided there's a change you're going to make based on the research. Okay, so feasibility assessment. What are some of the questions we need to ask? And we're building up to that next application so that I, I hope you'll... Um, Again, really think about your particular client and your particular target behavior from the first application as we're walking through what kind of a change would be feasible in that case. You may not know what the treatment is yet or what the research supported solution would be, but you can still think about these feasibility questions. And I'm going to talk about them in terms of group instruction. So if we don't have the expertise, if um, group instruction, uh, the variation we have evidence on is called direct instruction, capital D, capital I. It's a very specific technology. You can't just pick up a book and do it. You need some training and background. If nobody in your organization has done direct instruction before, to whom can you refer clients or where can you go to gain that expertise? Do you have the materials, space, time, and finances, not just to do the treatment and the change right now, but in the future? Can we sustain this over time? If not, how can you build those resources? And finally, what's our evaluation plan? Do we know what to look for and how to measure it in order to determine that the change is actually beneficial on a small scale before we, wa we roll it out broad scale uh, within our organization or classroom? Okay, so I have some questions here that kind of elaborate on those. And I'm actually, in the interest of time, going to kind of just skip over them. But they're there for your reference when you do your feasibility assessment uh, after your lit review um, and try to update your practices with some treatments that work. Okay, so again, material space time to sustain over time is very important and I hope you'll come back to these later. A little bit of detail on how to evaluate benefits. You need to know what to measure. So how would the students in our program, if group instruction was worth our time and worth our training investment, how would they improve? What behaviors would actually change? What would be the outcome measure, the real world test of whether that investment and that update was worth it? And we always have to focus on efficacy first and practicality and preference later. So do our teachers or those you supervise like it? Do parents like it? Should come as a question, which is an important one, only after you know that the intervention actually worked. Okay, so I can almost guarantee in the case of group instruction, parents will love that idea because it normalizes the educational setting for their child who's been um, probably taught one-on-one -on -one for some period of time. They want to see something that looks more like traditional general education. So yes, parents will prefer it, but guess what? If it's not effective, if it doesn't help the kids, it's premature to make decisions based on a parent's preference. We have to try and use um, the information we have available to find a happy medium that will be effective and actually benefit the learner. So efficacy first, practicality and preference later. Do we know when to measure? So what are the conditions where we could really see the benefits we're seeking and really be convinced that those were going to have generality um, to other important settings for our students? And finally, who has time and skills to collect the data we're going to use to evaluate these treatments? And who has time and skills to interpret the data? If we leave these things unassigned when we update our treatments based on the research literature, they probably won't get done, okay? Or they'll take much longer to get done um, than is realistic and beneficial um, to see through. So it's important that we know who plays each of the roles we've talked about uh, throughout these strategies. Okay, so in measuring worthwhile change, uh, change requires time. It requires redirected time and effort. 
I mentioned the importance if you're going to start a lit review team, a solution-oriented lit review team in the first strategy, you need to actually give people availability. Maybe take some work off their plate so that they can reallocate time to this task. Don't just add it on top. We won't get anywhere. Um, only good data can tell you if the change was worthwhile. So again, this isn't an optional step. It's not enough to just see what's in the literature and roll it out in practice. We have to actually determine if it's effective for our particular clients, our unique you know, um, clients, before we uh, make that kind of an investment. And those making change should, again, contact those reinforcers early and often. So can we see through our data that the new procedure works better? Is it faster or more effective? Does the new procedure save time for my teachers or parents or those uh, who are actually directly providing the um, treatment services? Do students prefer the new procedure to the previous procedures? Do I see less problem behavior? Or are they more willing to come to the sessions? This can be an important uh, measure. And finally, once we know we're effective, do caregivers, um, administrators, higher level decision makers for the work that we do uh, prefer the new procedure? Do th would they like to see us continue in that direction or stick with our old ways? You can see with all of these questions the importance of rolling these things out systematically and slowly rather than scaling up and doing an overhaul all at once. Okay, strategy number three. You're in the home stretch for this first uh, talk. How to use those data to adapt and deliver treatments that work. Because here's the truth. It doesn't matter what the research says. It matters in a sense that we need to distinguish between scientifically supported and likely to be effective from ineffective treatments. But that research wasn't conducted in your setting with your particular clients and with your teachers or staff or parents who have to deliver those treatments. Until you know about how the effective treatment meets with your particular case, it's impossible to know if this is going to be a worthwhile change. So that's where part of identifying treatments that work is actually identifying that they work with your context. And that means adapting based on data. Okay, so practice-based evidence, I mentioned it before. Um, some critical tools we need for evaluating treatment are reliable client performance data. So you have to knew, know how those um, goal behaviors, the things we really want to change, are or are not changing with the introduction of your new treatment or your modified treatment. And also teacher performance data. And here again, I'm using the term teacher a bit broadly. It's anybody, direct care staff, parents, um, teachers that you directly, meaning educators that you directly supervise, um, junior behavior analysts or behavior analysts in training that you supervise, whoever is responsible for directly carrying out the treatment change that you're prescribing. Those are the people whose integrity, the degree to which they're following the steps of the treatment in their daily practice, really matter for following through on a treatment that works. Okay, so let's talk just a little bit about the role of client performance data. Um, there's a great paper by Volmer and colleagues in 2008. This one also appears in BAP, and they provide just excellent considerations for how often and in what manner to measure reliability. Because if your data aren't high quality, they're not worth making decisions over. Okay? Anything worth doing is worth doing well, and you want those data to be a good foundation uh, for decision making. Go to Volmer and colleagues for, for some suggestions on getting this job done of collecting reliable uh, data and collecting treatment integrity data on a regular basis. Okay, but this is especially important when we're working with procedures in the early stages of implementation and also when students are not making progress. Okay, so um, I'm going to go kind of quickly on these examples. I'm not giving you labels here because I want you to focus on um, the pattern that you're seeing. So I will tell you this is a self-care skill. It's flossing that we're trying to teach. The bars indicate the total number of steps that a student is performing independently and the data path indicates the number of steps that are occurring in order. Okay, so you can see here the student is doing in this first treatment phase, baseline we got nothing. In this first treatment phase, they're doing some things, but they're not, we don't see an ascending trend there, right? This is not what we like to see if we think our treatment is effective. Um, and I'm going to tell you what's, uh, what's actually going on in this final phase in just another example or two. But if you have data like this and you know these data are reliable, that's telling you um, that something might be amiss. We made progress compared to baseline, but we don't seem to be going anywhere fast. Okay, and in the case of self-care, if you've taught these skills before, you may know that um, oftentimes we look at probe data. So each one of these data points actually reflects um, after five trials of teaching. So there's a lot of teaching going on here that's not necessarily captured by each data point. But we're not going anywhere fast. So that's the student data, and we're going to come back to it. But you need this information to make decisions about whether treatments are, in fact, working in your particular case. Research also demonstrates that certain integrity er errors do impact learning. Okay, they don't always stall learning like what we saw in the prior figure. Sometimes they just slow it down. 
And if you have nothing to compare that to, you have no way of detecting that learning isn't happening as quickly as it should be. This is why monitoring integrity and being able to get those red flags that maybe not everyone is doing the protocol the way it's been designed is just critical for success, for actually delivering a treatment that works. Okay, and some procedures are vulnerable based on complexity or context, like I mentioned earlier with self-care. I can't go through the wealth of literature that we have on um, these breakable procedures and critical steps, but this is an area of research we do in my lab and that I'm very excited to continue in the future, but we're accumulating a pretty good database on functional communication training, discrete trial teaching, guided compliance, a variety of evidence-based teaching procedures that you can mess up okay, by not doing a particular step correctly. Researchers are shedding light on what the most important steps to do precisely um, are in the success of each of these treatments. Forward chaining is the one we've chosen to tackle in our lab because it has a reputation. Again, it's not being very preferred for teachers to implement. Um, we also see ISPs and IEPs of students who've been working on toothbrushing for years. Okay? Not months, not weeks, but years. And is it that we lack the effective technology? No, we know how to teach a chain. We know how to do that, but actually seeing it through with integrity is a different story. And so Maeve Donnelly, um, one of my students, is responsible for that graph you saw earlier, working on flossing skills, and I'm going to show you what was going on in that um, first phase that was causing learning to look so low, and it actually came back to an integrity issue. We're only beginning to appreciate the importance of high integrity teaching. I, I want to mention, even though I've listed all these critical errors and breakable procedures that are still evidence-based, but you have to do them properly. Um, that there are probably other critical steps. We just haven't investigated them yet. So you can't like check off that list and say, no, 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 my teachers do that and that and that and we're good. You still have to measure integrity because there are still other things that could be affecting the likelihood of student success. Okay, so with self-care chains, this is what was going on. In this initial phase, Maeve Donnelly, one of my PhD students, actually um, did descriptive assessment. She watched teachers who said, hey, I struggle teaching self-care. I don't like to do it. I feel like I don't do it very well. My students don't make the progress I want. She saw the mistakes they were making, and then she experimentally manipulated them. Okay, so she tried to teach flossing, in this case, with those integrity errors present, and didn't get anywhere fast, right? Again, the student learned something, but it definitely wasn't a full flossing 10-step chain. Uh, when she lifted those integrity errors in the second panel here, you can see there's a little bit of delay, but relatively quickly, he's mastered the skill. This is a smart guy. We just weren't teaching him very effectively. Note how low integrity can mask an effective teaching procedure, and why integrity is an important part of following up on and determining if a change you've made, a procedure you've modified, or a new treatment you've added based on the literature is worth your time. Okay, one more example just to show you how powerful these integrity errors are. This is the same student, but working on a different um, skill. This was actually folding laundry. And um, you can see during baseline, he wasn't getting anywhere. Um, uh, very fast. He did have some responses he emitted. But the A phase is actually that low integrity phase, and the B phase is high integrity teaching. Notice what happens in these last phases. We actually broke his learning. We actually taught him a skill, and by not implementing subsequent trials properly, he lost it. And we had to start teaching effectively again to get it back. I think this is why we end up with students with toothbrushing for years. Not because they never knew how to do it, because they've probably known how to do it, and then been convinced to do it otherwise, and then maybe learned how to do it again. We have to watch integrity, okay, in order to follow through on treatments that work. Okay, so how do we get more out of the integrity data we're collecting? Again, Vollmer and colleagues are going to give you some great tips for how to work this into your routine every week, and hopefully it already is a part of your routine. Can I just see heads nodding if treatment integrity monitoring is part of what you do or part of what the people who supervise you do, okay? Some of you, that's good. Um, once you've got those data, you've put that work in. My goal is that you never collect a data point, never collect a piece of data that you don't actually use. Okay, if you're going to take the time to collect it, you want to take the time to potentially make decisions on it, not just put it in a binder somewhere, put it in an electronic file somewhere, never look at it again. You've got to use these data. So how do you get more out of the data you've already collected as part of your routine? Well, um, there are advantages to this that I've mentioned previously. Um, but we want to be able to identify the red flags, a situation where we might need to intervene. We also want to identify when people are doing a really good job with a really tough procedure. When I saw those treatment integrity data for self-care chains, I wanted to run out and find every teacher doing those difficult steps correctly and hug them, right? That may not have been very, very reinforcing for them. But we've got to spend more time taking good integrity data and going, man, this means I need to 
acknowledge and support and reinforce the people doing this good work, not just wait to see something that's amiss and come in with feedback and why didn't you do it the other way and retraining. Okay? These data are powerful. We need to use them in a greater variety of ways. So one strategy might be to actually aggregate data on teaching errors. Um, and it could be across clients in a particular program area that you know is different, uh, difficult, or it might be for a teacher across many different programs that they're doing with their clients. These are some actual data from Maeve's descriptive assessment that I mentioned earlier. And you can see that incorrect positioning, this is during toothbrushing, so this first bar, the tallest, incorrect prompting is also pretty high. But a number of opportunities teachers had to stand in the correct position as they were teaching tooth toothbrushing, which is to stand behind the client. They weren't doing that. Okay, so this can be a red flag. By compiling the data, we can quickly see there's something going on with the position of the teachers that might affect learning, especially when it comes to fading yourself out of the teaching situation. Let's take a closer look. And so the way you might respond to these data is to um, follow up. Start by informally asking teachers when and why they stand, the teachers we saw were standing right in front of the student, so between the student and the sink, which makes it easier when you're prompting like both sides of the mouth for brushing and things. But again, when it comes to fading, um, when it comes to them independently t you know, uh, doing steps involving the sink or materials on the sink, it's a real problem to be in front. So let's ask them why they're doing that. And there's always a good reason. It's your job as the supervisor or decision maker to figure out what that reason is. Then we could revise the protocol or materials so it's a little more practical for teachers to do it the right way. We might even decide that it's not so important that they stand behind, that maybe that's a change we come to later in the um, guidelines for that task analysis. And we clarify the correct position for all teachers. So sometimes just a matter of t task clarification can make a big difference. Okay. Um, so take home point, and then you're going to get another application here. Uh, it's important not only to identify treatments that work, but to adapt and follow through on them. And how do you adapt them and follow through and make sure they're worth your time? You collect good, reliable student performance data or client performance data, and you collect good teacher integrity data, okay, meaning high quality, data you can trust, data worthy of making a decision on. And we'll go much more into that in the second part today. So just to review quickly, the strategies were get to know what's in the literature by forming your solution-oriented lit review groups. Identify the most feasible and effective changes that you're going to implement first because they'll help teachers see success. They'll help teachers be in contact with um, more reinforcers because they no longer have to do a procedure that was cumbersome or not very effective. Okay? Finally, we need to use data first before we look at preference, before we look at practicality to evaluate ongoing impact of new procedures on clients and teachers. So this should be a scaled up systematic process, not all at once. Okay, so back to your application question. First, what role in your organization do you play in identifying and delivering treatments that work? Think about that for a second. What is your level of influence? Do you get to choose what teaching procedures are used? Are you mostly just responsible to use what somebody else tells you to use? And how much do you know about how they are actually making their selections, where the research fits in? Think about your role. Online, I hope you're doing this too and mm -hmm. jotting down your ideas in that handout that was provided in your folder. I think you have yep, I'm going to get to those. I definitely will. Okay, and then identify one tactic you could use based on where you are now. Okay, don't say I'm going to run out and start a lit review team and propose changes and assess feasibility and follow through and make sure it works. That's too much based on where you are right now and with that challenging area you had in mind earlier, what is your next step? What is a realistic next step you could take that might um, help you contribute to a solution for the problem you nominated in the first application? Or more generally to contribute to, if you can't think of a solution for that one or an addition, uh, think of how you can contribute to a better culture, a stronger culture of database decision making when it comes to selecting treatments that work. Think about your specific problem. And while you're thinking, I'm going to take a look at the question that Chris mentioned. So the question over here uh, was in relation to the integrity data um, that I showed for Maeve Donnelly's dissertation, what the prompting errors were on that actual graph. So we had prompting steps out of order. There were just two steps in a 10-step chain that on a subset of trials, three out of five trials, the teacher prompted them in the wrong order. 
Okay, that was one error. Also, uh, not delivering a reinforcer until the end of the, the chain. So if you've done forward chaining before, you deliver the reinforcer on the ch uh, training step. The teacher waited and did it at the end, which makes a lot of practical sense if you're working on toothbrushing, for example, because delivering the reinforcer if it's an edible is like a Cheeto in the mouth of a kid with toothpaste, right? <laughs> It doesn't make a lot of sense. So I understand why teachers modify that one. Um, so the prompting out of order, the reinforcer at the wrong time, and then not implementing a follow through strategy. So we have a bit of data suggesting that it's important to um, have participants uh, with your prompting, with your physical guidance, complete the chain even after you get through the training step, that that will contribute to faster learning, as opposed to just ending the chain or just fully manually guiding all the remaining steps. But we see that teachers, probably for time reasons, sometimes skip that final follow-through strategy um, of actually allowing the student to try and emit subsequent responses. So great question. Thank you for that. Okay, did everybody come up with a next step? Just one. Something realistic that's going to help you get more research and uh, evidence-based practice literature into your decision making. Okay. So I have a couple suggestions, and I hope that I'm speaking to all of the audiences who are with us today. Um, I know that we probably have a mix, and uh, Kobe indicated that a lot of uh, the folks who've participated in the past do have some supervisory and training responsibilities. So you're not always the ones delivering the treatments, but you're actually preparing other people to deliver the treatments. Um, and no matter where you are in the scheme of things, uh, there are ways that you can get more data into your decisions. And I want to cover just a couple suggestions related to that here. So direct care teachers or direct care staff, people actually delivering the treatments that work, hopefully with uh, clients, whoever they may be. Um, a next step for you might be to ask your supervisor and see if your ideas jive with some of mine, but yours are probably better and probably definitely more individualized to your context. Um, ask your supervisors for opportunities to build your understanding and use of data in your daily work. Ask them why you're taking certain data and how that affects decisions that they make, how they use those data. If you've never seen a graph of the data you're learning to collect, ask someone to show you that graph and ask someone to tell you how to understand what you see on the graph, how to visually inspect and interpret those data. If you're taking the time to take the data, you have a right to know how it's impacting and improving um, the services that are being provided. You could also consider coordinating your own uh, monthly article club. And I'm saying monthly because if you don't have a goal, you know, in a solution-oriented program, it's unlikely this is going to be uh, something you can squeeze in as often, but maybe once a month for fun, over drinks, just potentially, uh, if you're old enough. Um, you could get together uh, and pick an article, one article that you and some of your highly motivated colleagues are going to read in advance and talk about at the bar. Um, you could even invite supervisors to suggest the topics or areas of research that they think are relevant or um, interesting that you might enjoy, okay? So this is kind of a, a fun way, maybe, uh, to build your research chops and build your data-driven chops and just educate yourself so that as you move up in your position or as you, you know, have a longer standing rela rela relationship with your organization, that you can be a part of that decision-making culture that looks to the literature for answers, okay? Even if it's not a written part of your job description now. So direct care teachers, you can do this. Um, how can supervisors contribute? So here I'm talking about the supervising practitioners like BCBAs or speech pathologists or the special educators who are actually making decisions for how other people will interact with the students or clients. Um, you can advocate and model data-driven practices. Okay, you can tell people how you're using the research in the work that you're doing and you can advocate to higher-ups, to administrators, your own supervisors, that you need time for this important part of your discipline. Okay, the model piece is really important here. You guys notice how we're teaching even when we don't realize we're teaching. So all the direct care teachers and staff that you supervisors work with see how you use data or how you don't use data. Okay, they're paying attention. Um, I learned this uh, in a pretty powerful way with one of my earliest home-based clients that I worked with, and I'm not going to use his real parents' names, but um, I learned a lot about his parents' life outside of our sessions um, because he was such an astute observer and imitator, and so he was learning even when they weren't planning on it. And so when he would get frustrated, he would actually call his parents using their voices. Um, and it was clear that his mom wore the pants because it would go something like this. And I'm inserting my own parents' names. Um, it would go something like this, Gary, <laughs> if he was upset. And that was his mom. And then his dad was, Darlene. <laughs> so 
very, very uh, salient example of how we're teaching even when we don't realize we're teaching. And so you supervisors are teaching your uh, direct care teachers how to uh, behave with respect to the research by what you do, whether you realize it or not. Uh, I also noticed that I refer more to data than data now that I live on the uh, East Coast. I've added that ER, your visa card, your data, where's your data? Um, so we're, we're, we're learning and teaching even when we don't realize it. Supervisors can also educate their supervisees and parents on how to use data, um, how they use the data that they help to collect. So again, it's important to talk about data and show data, not just gather it and store it away, um, but let everybody in every level of your teaching environment see how those data play an integrative role in the decisions that are made and um, the teaching you do every day. Okay? They should be an essential part and people should know what role they play. Then finally, higher level decision makers. So our parents, our real bosses, uh, parents of the, those that we serve, and the administrators who sort of set up our systems, how can they contribute to more research-driven practices? Well, parents and administrators definitely can ask teachers and supervise, uh, supervisors how their data are being used. So again, they can help to hold us accountable for making time to get to those data, um, whether it's in the research or in your own evidence-based practice. We can also ask supervisors about the supports they need to make data a bigger part. Okay, so how can administrators help you guys to achieve a higher quality of data or uh, to improve the utility of the data you're collecting? So again, if you're um, collecting binders of data and somebody needs time to update those in graphs, um, the data in the binder are not as useful on the utility dimension as the data on the graph. You need those data to be visual. So how do you get them visual? Do you need another support person who comes in to just help update graphs? Is there better technology you might be able to add to your system? The quality piece, we have a lot of data, but we don't know if it's reliable. That's a problem. It's not a good basis for decision making. What supports do you need that administrators could help you with and ask about in order to get higher quality data? I want you to notice what's not mentioned here. Uh, it's quantity, okay? I, I mentioned the importance of if you're gonna have people uh, collecting data, you want to make sure that they actually are using those data. It's an investment of time. And so, while we want to improve quality and we want to improve utility of the data we're collecting, it's the rare case we want to just collect more data, like more target behaviors or more frequent measures on target behaviors. That's the last kind of update or improvement I would look to make. Um, part of why I say this, and another good reference for you guys, is Kasdan, Alan Kasdan in 1973, uh, I believe, it might be 75, in Java has a great paper on reliability of behavioral data. And he cites some excellent research, even though it's dated, there's still relevant examples, um, where just by adding another dimension that teachers have to measure of the behavior that they're observing, and just by adding another behavior, you can dramatically affect reliability. That is to say, we get the highest quality data when we're measuring relatively few things at a time. I think even with good technology, this is an important consideration. Um, and then the follow-up to that, if you're collecting a bunch of data that aren't actually being used for decision-making, that's not the most reinforcing um, uh, or the most motivating reason to continue collecting those data and really putting a lot of care into that activity. If you don't know how they're being used and you don't see how they're actually translating to effects. So quality and utility over quantity. That's the big message here for administrators. Um, and parents are other big decision makers who can help to influence and advocate for us in practice. OK. So you made it through the first set of strategies. And we even have a few minutes for questions. So I'd love to hear what your response is and any specific items that um, we can follow up on for you. Nobody online yet. I'm putting you on the spot. Questions? Okay. Am I? Did uh, you say there's one coming, Chris? He said there's a there's a short delay for the oh, okay. for the people yeah, online. Yeah, we can wait a, so. minute, wait a minute. Just by people here in the room and online, feel free to <laughs> weigh in. Were you guys able to come up with a problem scenario and a next step based on these recommendations? You feel like you can go back and advocate a little more effectively um, for the for the data driven practices? Yeah. <laughs> 